Hello there, Alaskans, wherever you are. Welcome to the Must Read Alaska Show. Coming to you from somewhere in Alaska. This is the place where we talk about, you guessed it, Alaska. Where we keep the mainstream media on their toes and where we are standing up for what's right and a world run by leftists. You can find out more by heading over to mustreadalaska.com and also checking out the Must Read Alaska YouTube channel for some really great content. But first, let's get this party started. Hello, everyone. Welcome aboard. This is the Must Read Alaska show. I'm your host, James Baston, coming to you from somewhere in Alaska. We have a great show lined up for you today. I've got four or five articles that I've picked to, to discuss. A lot of the articles that I'm going to be talking about come directly from the Must Read Alaska website. That's the place to where you can get a lot of your news. Um, those are great articles that Suzanne Downing puts together. Um, you can find podcast and live video footage also from her and John Quick throughout the week. Look, if you want to keep the mainstream media on their toes, this is the place to do it. And we need your help. One way that you can help us is by visit by visiting the website at muscreatalaska.com. There is a donate button uh, that helps us, uh, helps us put this content out. Your support is what makes this possible. So we also need you to, to be part of that. Come and join the other 27,000 people who, who like us on Facebook. Um, it's, a, it's a great way to keep updated on, on topics that affect us here in the state of Alaska. So please join us. We want to thank our sponsorship for this week's Must Read Alaska show, and that is Charlie Pierce for Governor. Those sponsorships is what makes this show possible. So again, thank you very much, Charlie Pierce for Governor. We really appreciate your support. First up is a segment that I'm calling Mandate Freedom. This is where I'm going to discuss some of the some of the items dealing with mandates that are still here in the state of Alaska as well uh, at the national level. Uh, last week, I kind of I kind of went into some of the areas that were still that we were still seeing problems when it comes to specifically mask and vaccine mandates. So it's one of those areas that I get fired up over real easy. Uh, one of the things that I'm looking at today is. The end of mass mandates everywhere in the United States goes mass free. Sounds great. Long time coming. Should have been that way probably sometime last year. Uh, it looks like finally Hawaii just uh, announced that they were going to end their mass mandates. Kind of unfortunate for my family because we actually had a trip to, to Maui and we canceled it because of the mandates that they still had in place. But I'm glad to see that they finally come around. Um, California uh, just uh, just listed that uh, they were dropping their mask mandates. On on paper, it sounds good. The problem is that still yet counties and school districts can keep masks on if they if they if they so want to, and that's what's going to happen. Um, I know specifically in LA County, school districts not going to drop those those mask mandates on those kids. Uh, same way with Hawaii. Hawaii is not going to drop them on their on their kids either. So um, even though um, there is no mask mandates throughout the state, we got the CDC that's telling us that masks do not need to be worn uh, indoors uh, very often. But here we are. Um, we're still we're still in this 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 segment that I want to call um, uh, the liberal segment of we like to control what it is that you do uh, And here in this state. I'm going to give you a few examples. Um, just um, just this week, um, I mentioned the um, the Juno School District. Juno School District, for whatever reason, magically April fourth is whenever they're going to allow masks to be optional um, at the school district level. So so again, it's not about the numbers anymore. It's about control, and they want to keep controlling this. Um, I'm looking at Sitka. Sitka basically made mask optionals March first. That was one of the places that I mentioned. And I've been dealing with the University of Fairbanks because University of Anchorage just made masks optional here just last week. University of Fairbanks, their numbers were zero. They went into the green. And just this week, I was having arguments on the telephone with their professors, my family basically discussing why our kids still have masks on. Even on their website, it talks about being in the green. And if they're on the, in the green, they don't have to wear a mask. It becomes optional. But it's funny they don't communicate that to the students. So they just let that just kind of lay out there 
And even the instructors aren't paying attention to their own website and their own data. So if it's put the mask on, they'll go out of the way to make sure they force that you do it. But whenever it becomes the other way, and now we're in a good area to where masks don't need to be worn, they don't want to talk about it. They don't want to broadcast it. You know, they can send a text out to everybody campus wide and immediately let them know that they're in the green. Didn't do that. So what happened the first day my, my child went back into the classroom? He went back in without a mask. The professor went off on him and said, hey, you still have to wear a mask. And he's arguing with his professor that they're in the green on, on the website. It shows that masks don't have to be worn, but still yet they're forcing these kids to do that. So what they end up doing is, is they end up pitting the student against the professors in these schools because, again, they don't care. It's no longer about education. We've got basically a lot of people from California and Washington and Oregon. When you look at the background of most of these professors and where they've come from, they're not the typical Alaskans that you think of. So we have these liberal areas within the state that are controlling the education of our kids. And you know what? We're going to have to get involved with it. If we don't get involved with it as parents and as lawmakers, we're going to allow this to continue to get worse. So I, I, I hope that, um, that parents will engage when it comes to your school district, when it comes to your child's education, even at the higher level of, of college. So the state capitol, great. They dropped their, their mask mandates back on February 23rd. Should have been a lot longer. Again, here we are, a state that we have more conservatives in the Senate and House, and they cannot even uh, take control of this craziness. So that's my update right now. I'll probably do this next week just to see if things have gotten better. You know, I'm still optimistic that we're moving in the right direction, but it's very slow. It's very slow, and it disappoints me at sometimes because I just see the pain that it's putting my children through. And I know I've got a lot of other family members that talk to me and friends that talk to me that they're dealing with the same things. So how about a fun discussion dealing with everything coming out of Juno as it concerns the permanent fund dividend, the energy rebate, and now the motor fuel tax that they want to halt. So we've got three items that are tied together and it's interesting how everything in Juno just gets so mangled and you cannot get anybody to agree. First of all, I, I know for a fact that we're not going to see a statutory PFD, not going to happen. Even in today's state revenue forecast, uh, Suzanne Downing just put up a, an article on March 15th on the Must Read Alaska website that states that there's an extra 3.6 billion over this year and next year that is being, that's being calculated into the budget. So even with extra funding, you're not going to get a statutory PFD. Get ready for that. So let's go to the next level. Okay, if we can't get that, you would think that at a minimum, the legislature and the governor could come together on a 50-50 that most people talk about. Let's do a 50-50 this year. And on top of that 50-50, let's add the energy rebate. Governor Palin did that back in the day when oil was $140 a barrel. So you're going to get at a minimum, if, 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 you, if you think Juno was looking at it properly, you'd get a 50-50 split on your PFD, you'd get an energy rebate, and you know what? You can throw the, the, the fuel tax in there. Um, again, that's the minor part of this. When you look at the numbers, you know, it's going to be anywhere from $40 to $80 is what it's going to save the typical Alaskan. Not as big, as, as big a deal as the other two, but you've got to think about it. They're going to give you an energy rebate because they don't want to give you something that, that looks like, smells like the permanent fund at its statutory numbers. Because if they do that, they have lost their fight. So they're going to have to come to some kind of compromise. And that compromise, if it doesn't take place now, everybody who's running for office right now who's telling you they're going to defend your PFD, don't have a chance. Don't have a chance because right now the numbers are there. You've got the funding. You've got the budget. You can do it both for state government and for the people in Alaska. And this will show you as they get through this session how serious they are. And again, you're going to have to make 
you're going to have to make decisions on sending these people back, especially even if the ones in the minority who don't have any clout, it, it's basically, it's just basically a waste of time of their efforts to try to continue to hit this PFD um, at the full statutory amount. Um, I want to see everybody follow the law. That would simplify this thing. But basically what they're saying is they are following the law because they're the ones who gets to decide where the revenue goes. That is now their law that they're following uh, until we get to a point uh, to open this up to where the people of the state of Alaska puts this in, into, into the Constitution. And again, that's still a big hurdle. I'm not sure that that people are going to vote for that because a lot of people are just as scared if they open that door. Uh, it's not only going to affect anything dealing with the PFD, it could affect other things that they may not want to see changed. So it's, um, it's a big problem that we have when it comes to uh, how this plays out. But at least this year, my plan, my recommendation would be settle on a 50-50, add the energy rebate to it, call it the energy rebate, and do the fuel tax um, and go home, go home and be done with it, help Alaskans out, and then let us get, get back to work uh, next year, hopefully with a new group of people that uh, uh, may have a different outlook. So looking at the news at the national level, this week I found a, a story that I really enjoyed, and it was dealing with Ohio. And Ohio and Alaska now have something in common. We're one of 23 states and Ohio this week joined the list of states, becoming the latest state to allow concealed gun carry without a permit. I thought that was just fantastic to see that come through. So I got to give props to the governor of Ohio, Mike DeWine. He's the one who signed the bill that eliminates concealed carry requirements for Ohioans age 21 and over. Um, I think that typically you will see in the state of Ohio, just like you have seen in the other 23 states, Crime typically decreases whenever we can protect ourselves. Law enforcement is reactionary, and they're typically never where we need them whenever we're in a situation that we may need to protect ourselves or our family. So I think this bill going into effect in Ohio is going to, is going to help that state out, and it should hopefully drive their numbers down. And it's kind of interesting, some of the some of the things that uh, um, they put into their law, which, uh, which I find interesting, was uh, Ohio citizens will no longer have the duty to notify every law enforcement officer during an official stop. Instead, the person must disclose that they're carrying a concealed ha handgun only after the officer asks them. So again, if you're a law-abiding citizen and you're carrying concealed, if you're not doing anything wrong, that weapon is not going to affect anything that's going on with the situation you're, you're coming up against, especially when you're, um, if you just happen to be pulled over. Also, motorists during a traffic stop who failed to notify an officer, that was punishable by up to six months and a thousand dollar fine. So they have eliminated that. And uh, it just, uh, it just makes it more common sense for law abiding citizens to be able to carry and protect themselves. That's one of the, I, I remember back, um, Gosh, I think it was, uh, it's probably been 10 plus years ago, whenever the state of Alaska changed to concealed, that you didn't need a permit to carry a concealed weapon. And uh, I think that's, um, that's exactly what government needs. We need more people who can legally protect themselves and protect those around them. I'm all for going out and getting training. Look, I've been in the military for 13 years. Prior to that, um, I grew up um, hunting and knew how to use a handgun. I, I love taking my kids to the range. Um, I help train um, here in Kenai. Um, some, of the, some of the classes that I get to help train are women on target. I take my kids to the range um, during the summers. So I think that it's important that you take on that responsibility to be able to go out and use a weapon safely. But I also love what the Ohio governor did here and glad that um, they have joined Alaska and um, I think it's the right move. So after the great news, we're at the state level. The governor from Ohio defended the Second Amendment by passing the concealed carry law legislation. Now let's go to the federal level. And if you remember, this $1.5 trillion spending bill uh, that was put in front of 
um, our our senators and Congress people back uh, late last Wednesday at 1.30 in the morning. Um, it passed the House that night with support of all the Democrats and 39 Republicans, including Alaska Congressman Don Young. And then on Thursday, the bill passed the Senate with the support of all Democratic senators, including 18 Republicans, which included Senator Murkowski from Alaska. Senator Dan Sullivan did not vote on it. Uh, he said he didn't have time to read the bill. And can you imagine the bill was 2,700 plus pages. So I doubt if many of the people who voted on this read it. And I guess the, the sad thing about it is, is there were some gun control provisions that stayed in this bill that they did not catch. And um, if, I guess the sad thing that reading into it, that if all of the Republicans would oppose the bill in unison, they were short a senator that was pretty much an anti-gun person on the other side, and they could have killed this thing, and they didn't. Um, so uh, one of the biggest things here that, that really stands out to me in one of the sections is, is that that is law now in this funding bill is that now funding for the ATF, um, they can deputize local police to enforce federal gun laws. And this especially is used to undermine the Second Amendment protection in states. So now they basically have a section in here that's going to allow ATF to deputize our local police. So, so again, just think we want to establish a sanctuary city, a sanctuary borough, which in the borough of the Kenai that I live in um, was passed a, a resolution that called for the Kenai Peninsula Borough to be a, a, a sanctuary Second Amendment borough. Um, now they have a way of getting around those state type of laws. So this is, um, again, we take our wins and we take our losses and all of a sudden, boom, you can have two right in front of you, one dealing with states' rights and one dealing with the federal, basically, who's trying to trump states' rights when it comes to Second Amendment and the ownership of, 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 of handguns and rifles and what they, they think is dangerous. So keep your eyes open. Um, this, is, this is important legislation, and I hate that um, we have some of those uh, members that we sent to Washington that supported it. So here's a fun topic to finish off the the week with um, dealing with campaign contributions. And it looked like the House Wednesday night passed uh, a campaign contribution cap um, that has to be uh, pushed along to the Senate. House Bill 234 introduced by Cal Schrage uh, was introduced and it looked like it passed pretty much along caucus lines um, in a vote of 22 to 18. Um, the Republicans we're concerned that uh, the bill sets the uh, limits at uh, $2,000 per campaign cycle um, and out of state contributions uh, are limited to 25% of all donations. Um, look, I've, I've run for office a couple of times. I understand the importance of, of raising money, but also important uh, understand the influence that it has. If, if we have unlimited amounts that can be given to a candidate, people aren't giving you those large amounts uh, just to, uh, because they like you. They want to influence what it is that you're doing. They want to influence your vote. Um, I, I didn't mind the, the $500 limits. I thought that was appropriate. That kind of kept everybody in check. You know, again, we were still dealing with, with outside influences and, you know, larger groups, whether, you know, whether it's a union or, or whether it's um, uh, an organization that wants to influence you. Uh, in my opinion, the smaller amounts that we can set, the better, um, more money in campaigns, basically, I think it just, it leads to um, politicians who, who, who have to depend on raising money and being influenced in ways that they probably shouldn't have to be. So I am in favor of smaller amounts. Um, I did not mind where we used to be at, and I hope when this gets over to the Senate, um, hopefully they'll make some adjustments to it and keep everything in check. Um, Less money in politics is better than more money, my opinion. So again, campaign, campaign contributions, um, it's, going to, it's going to be interesting to see how the Senate deals with this. Thanks again for watching all the Must Read Alaska shows this week. Hope you enjoyed the content. Again, if you want to help us keep the mainstream media on their toes, please visit us at mustreadalaska.com and donate. That's what helps keep this going.
And again, I'm your host, James Faison. Have a great weekend.